morning everybody, here in the first set of sales at Snowflake. Um, well this is a technical session, the first 15 minutes won't be, so I'll just give you a nice overview of Snowflake and uh, hopefully that will reinforce why you're here. Uh, just a, a brief show of hands, although you're coming to find out about Snowflake, who's actually used Snowflake or has got a bit more knowledge or we all kind of started from zero? Now you look that, don't you? <laughs> okay, so that's good, we've got a nice level set. So. Um, please fire any questions on this, we've got 15-20 minutes, I'll just take you through why Snowflake exists, what we're doing in the marketplace, a little bit about the architecture which is really important about Snowflake, and, um, and just kind of take you through before we really dig into the technical stuff. So Snowflake is a data warehouse built for the cloud, and the original vision, if you're moving to cloud, there's certain features and capabilities you really want to take advantage of. The only way you can do that is with a blank piece of paper, write a new enterprise data warehouse and build it and take it into the cloud. Um, you want to be a complete SQL data warehouse and that's really so the skills that you have in-house which are nice and simple, um, you're not retooling, reinvesting, training your guys etc, you're just familiar with SQL, you want to use a SQL data warehouse so we're, we're SQL compliant and a SQL enterprise data warehouse. Um, in the cloud you get to take advantage of, of scalability, various other bits, and, and with a, a blank piece of paper, um, you can then build in optimization and performance and have that automated within the platform um, as a service. And that's really the thing, Snowflake is SQL Data Warehouse as a service, as a platform, and minimal or zero management is what you're trying to achieve. I'll dig into these areas in a bit more depth. All of your data, um, hopefully one thing you're aware of with Snowflake is that we take all sizes and scales of data of all types as well. So although we're a SQL data warehouse, we do take it natively JSON, XML, um, Avro, Parquet, etc. So you get really a data warehouse, or is it a data lake, you're putting all your data into one place. And all of your users, with, with cloud scale and elastic capability, what you really want to do is, is scale out on demand with, uh, to cater for all your users. Um, and on to scale back in as well and have no concurrency because what you're doing, you, you don't want to limit your resources on your performance, you want the best um, end user uh, capability that you can give um, so you can put an SLA on your service and you can make your users happy as I told you're using. And data sharing, that's um, something which is really very unique on Snowflake because within Snowflake and built into the ecosystem is an ability to share data with your ecosystem, third party partners, etc., without data leaving your environment, and you can control that. So, in today's um, security risk, etc., that's really something we need to focus on. Um, and pay for what you use. Um, as I'll go into that in a little bit detail later on, but really with cloud scale, scale elastic capability, scale out, scale back in, you only really want to pay for what you use. Do you know how big your data warehouse is going to be in six months, one year, three years? Can you go to procurement and provision that out there um, and then not use that because you'll then grow into that scale. You want to grow in as you use or shrink as you use and grow that capability. So this is the really the underpinning architecture which allows Snowflake to give those features and capabilities within a cloud data warehouse. The traditional um, data warehouse, shared disk, shared nothing, I won't put names on these but you're familiar with these architectures. Snowflake is very different, unique architecture, it's multi-clustered shared data. What this means is you have um, compute services which you can put out to your users so you get no concurrency issues, users are accessing all your data all at the same time and give you that elastic capability. So that's really the unique data sharing um, architecture from Snowflake. How this really works when we're putting together how the system centralized storage um, like Amazon we use S3 um, so all of your data is on S3 storage so you get really cheap cloud scale storage which you can grow into wrap around that is a compute for loading analytics development and then everything that's coming in and out of Snowflake is on the service platform which is managing all the transaction security all the metadata we build a lot of metadata around Snowflake which is not just for security, for querying your data, but also allows us to give massive performance with the architecture um, and then the optimization and management. So that's the three tiers of Snowflake. And then this is provided to you as a service. So with the zero management, you're just putting your data in, analyzing your data, everything happens as a service, and then no management, etc. underneath that. 
how that works when you're logically separating out on using. This is a typical enterprise data warehouse where you've got um, your storage and your SQL. In this instance, that's storage and compute. With Snowflake, with the architecture, we break that out, put the storage centrally in the S3 storage, and then you have virtual data warehouses which you can then scale and, and line up for lines of business. So with your data centralized, you're then using finance, ETL, marketing users, they all have their own compute, their own data warehouse, which is accessing that centralized <coughs> data. That can scale elastically, so small, medium, extra large, you can change that sizing, you're only paying for what you use, you have no concurrency issues. If ETL suddenly goes off the scale, that doesn't affect any of the other users because they're all isolated, because you've got that segregation on the compute side, and everyone is accessing the, uh, the data all at the same time. And we're pulling out the metadata on, on the whole system we can go through. And I mentioned that we put um, all the data in, so all that data, as well as your SQL data, is all your XML data, etc., which is put in there for users as well, with no degradation of performance. And then, of course, you need to analyze your data and do everything you know with your users. So you've got Python, Spark, you're using MicroStrategy, Looker, Informatica Talent for all your ETL. Um, a lot of vendors now, virtually all the big vendors, and, and coming out constantly is more connectors, direct connectors into Snowflake, uh, where you can also use ODBC, JDBC, direct SQL to access Snowflake in your data. So breaking down those uh, six features that I'm going through, as we mentioned, um, the standard SQL, ANSI SQL compliant, transaction compliant, ODBC, JDB connectors, and native connectors coming out all the time. So you don't have to retool, you don't have to reskill. The aim is to be really simple. No management. Um, infrastructure, tuning, you're not looking after any of that. No optimization, no indexing. You don't have to vacuum partition your data. When you rescale and scale out and go from a small to an extra large, you don't need to do anything with your data. You're just adding more compute and then just consuming that. When you're done with that large job, you come back in. So you don't have to go from one cluster to another cluster, manage your data, no downtime. That's all interactive, that's all live. I think you guys pull that out when you're going there with the demo. Um, and then all of the data, and that's from a size and a scale and a type as well. So we can scale from zero to multi-petabyte, you'll have a fully elastic capability, um, structured data for all the size and types of data as well. And everything is centralized with cheap cloud storage and S3, which we actually do that as a pass on cost. So what you're paying now for S3 is what you pay for um, Snowflake storage with compression as well. So there's probably cost savings that can be brought in there. And all of your users, because you're segregating the users that are accessing all the data centrally, you can support an unlimited amount of users, you can scale that out, you just go to lines of business. So rather than having one compute resource accessing one size of data scale, you put that out to lines of business, which can be as many as you want, and then you've got a real focus on your users. You then break that down to how many um, what the cost is on a particular project. If you need to stand a project up for a month, give them some compute access to data, stand that up, and then you've actually got a cost breakdown of what that project is. When you're finished, you just pause it or take it down. Data sharing. Um, within Snowflake, built into the security is the ability for you to create a view that you can then access and give that to a third party within the Snowflake environment. So you have a Snowflake customer to a Snowflake customer, one of your third parties with your partner eco group. You can just give them a view, they can access that live data. At the minute, if you need to give access to a third party, you need to extract that, put some security around it, send it off to them, you wave goodbye to it, you don't know what they're going to do with it, security's gone down the drain, your data stays in Snowflake. So they're accessing your live data, as soon as it changes in your system, they see that, you're in control of that, you've got security of that, you want to chop them off, you can cut access, and that's done. And you pay for what you use, this is a real bonus of, of Snowflake. So your usage varies within your own data warehouse. This could be a day, a week, a month, a year, it goes up and down and fluctuates. And you want your system to do that as well. Currently, you need to provision, this is my maximum, that's where I need to be. So you're over provision, this white space here, you're overpaying and losing money. With Snowflake, your usage follows your usage pattern. You're scaling up, you're scaling down. That can be automated to scale out horizontally, scale vertically. You're only paying for what you use. You're not over-provisioning. You don't need to worry when a sudden department comes to you and says, I've got this massive project, it needs to go live on Monday, and if 
ten times bigger than what you're doing today. That's fine. Snowflake, you just scale out, you can do that, it's not a problem. Cater for that project, then bring it back in when it's done. It takes away a big problem for you. <coughs> because we're an enterprise, we've built in scale out, backup resiliency, so we automatically replicate data across availability zones. Resiliency um, and geographic separation if these kind of ones come in. Um, we're fully online 24-7, so any updates, we typically update every two weeks into the, um, the system with rollouts and updates and patches, fixes, etc. That's no downtime to you, so that happens seamlessly in the back end. 24-7 enterprise data warehouse. And security is built in by design, so all data is encrypted in flight and rest, etc. There's various um, options within Snowflake to bring your own security keys, key rotation things. Uh, and various HIPAA and PCI compliance because you know, we have uh, large banks, finance institutions which have kind of really tested Snowflake for security um, and everything is built in. Snowflake is a multi tenant platform but we really recognise that and build that security within there. And what customers use Snowflake for is performance, concurrency, simplicity. Um, this, this is what they really get out. For you guys, it takes away a problem, you're managing that solution out to your internal or external customers you want great performance with the current history of SLA around performance and really simplicity as well. And just a bit of a marketing slide here, just kind of throwing away some benefits that customers have used. Using NoSQL, 8 hours to prepare data, Snowflake down to 1.5 minutes. Uh, data warehouse, 20 plus hours, fast analytics down to 45 minutes. Snowflake really does perform, it's really easy to use, zero management, and makes your life much better. That's a very quick overview of Snowflake. Uh, I am stopping for the full session. I will be here at the end. Please ask any questions. So now. So yes, we're going to be working through a, uh, a scenario which is based on this fictional company of ZTS Limited. Um, I'll explain a bit about their, about their, scenario, their scenario first, and then I'll go through um, a sequence of different steps showing some of the features of Snowflake and showing how we can build up this uh, warehouse. Um, but to introduce the uh, ZTS guys, their company who are doing kind of traditional IT monitoring type work, um, and they've got sort of agents and, um, monitoring on various different types of assets, so maybe some IT hardware, um, some satellites, some other bits of hardware kit back into their monitoring. Um, but we can say they've also kind of recently acquired another company and they're moving into a kind of IoT <coughs> asset tracking space. They're also now adding in really a variety of any other kind of asset which they might want to track. So in this case we've got some vehicles and we've got some pirate ships for some reason. Um, but some, yeah, aircraft and all those kind of other things which they might want to add in as well. And what they're doing is they're pushing all that data into this their combined on-premise sort of centralized uh, storage um, and then they're doing some clever kind of analytics and prediction of various different trends and events that are taking place and, and those kind of things. So it's quite nice in that they're able to use their existing kind of original left-hand side architecture here to add this new data, the new data types on top, but they're running into some of the problems you might expect. So they're um, throwing a lot more data at their existing um, infrastructure. Um, data is in a variety of different formats, um, and you know, the infrastructure is coming to the end of life and all those kind of classic problems that, that people face. So they're looking at, very conveniently, they're looking at Snowflake to do a little, a little POC and see how they can move to um, Cloud Data Warehouse. So what we're going to build as part of this, this process. So we can say, as, uh, as far as this POC is concerned, they're going to give us some event data and some asset data. That's already neatly loaded into some um, flat files on, on S3. Um, and that consists of maybe a few, a few billion rows and four columns of, four columns of data um, as far as the events are concerned. For the assets, it's uh, you know, a small list of things with the actual objects that's there. Which they're, what we're going to do is set up a Snowflake tenant for them. Um, we're going to set up their ZTS database. 
and I'm going to set up some layers as part of a sort of modern data architecture. So this is typically something which we, which we use quite a lot. We have to say we'll have an ingestion layer where we can just land the data into raw format. <coughs> that typically be just on S3, for example. We're going to have a curation layer where we make some kind of basic fixes to, to the data, so maybe fixing the nulls and some very, very basic rules. And then a calculation layer, which is where we build up our business, business intelligence and maybe do some kind of aggregation, some sums, some more complicated transformations, those kind of things. And the way we do that is by provisioning a, um, a sequence of warehouses to do the actual compute. Um, and that's going to let us bring the data in from S3, do our computation with a nice animation. <laughs> and then once that's in place, we've got that stack of data built up, we're then going to add Zoom data onto the right hand side, which is a um, visualization and data, a big data, real time data visualization tool. Not too critical if you haven't, you haven't heard of it before, I'll go through a little bit about that, a um, couple, of, couple of features and show it, show it in action. To a later stage in the in the demo. So here we can build up a couple of different a couple of different dashboards and bits and pieces there. So at that point onto our onto our demonstration. So any, any questions about our fake scenario? No, really, very, very real company. ZTS. <laughs> I wouldn't have thought so. Okay. So first up, we're going to just create a database. Unsurprisingly. Um, we're going to create our um, different layers for our ingestion, curation, and calculation. And then we're going to add uh, both an external stage and a file format. So, in this case, what we're going to do is for our ingestion layer, we're actually going to get Snowflake to look at an existing S3 bucket, which already, you know, which in this case, ZTS have provided to us. So they give us access through um, the uh, key and secret through um, S3. So we're going to use that as our external stage. And then we're going to use a file format definition, which will let us say, well, this is the kind of structure of the data, these are the delimiters, these are the columns, all those kind of things. So then when we move on to the next, next step of the process and import the data, Snowflake is able to understand the structure that's, that's actually there on the, uh, on the files. So what I'm going to do now is switch over to the screen. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to tap backwards and forwards between, mostly between the Snowflake UI here and, and PowerPoint, just so you get an idea of what I'm going to be, be doing. Um, so, getting started here, I'm going to log in as our ZTS Alex user. This is our Alex the admin. Um, so we can say he's been, he's been set up as our initial user on the system here. Um, and we'll go through and see some, some of the things which he can set up, and then later on we may without spoiling it too much, that's a few more. Okay, so we've already talked about the, the some of the different components of, of Snowflake um, in terms of databases and warehouses and things. This is the web UI which I'm going to do most of the work in. There's also a command line interface which I might use a little bit as well for pushing some data in now. But for now what I'm going to do is just give you a quick tour of what's in here. So then as we go as I'm using all these various different tabs through the process you'll see what's going on. So in the middle here we've got this script which <coughs> Um, which is all, um, as you can see, all the nice, everything we're going to be doing here in this script is going to be just SQL statements. Um, we're going to run those line by line. And if I switch back to this first screen here, we've got the databases tab. So, at the moment we've just got a sample database in here. And if I click it, you see kind of traditional things you would expect to see from exploring a database. So, we've got various different tables, we've got views and schemas and file formats is a bit potentially different as we've just talked about, but various kinds of things you would expect to see in there. On the warehouses tab, what you see is the uh, compute resources that we've provisioned. There's nothing there yet because this is a completely empty account for now. What we'll see here is uh, various different rows of warehouses which we've provisioned, the status they're in, all those kinds of things. We've got the worksheet which we just looked at, which is where we're going to be doing most of the uh, work during this process. And then finally, we've got this history tab, which will show us um, from some previous 
previous times which I've uh, run this run this demo. Um, examples of all the different queries which have been run. So what you'll see is each individual query has got a separate query ID. You can see the history of those. You can filter them down, obviously, to different users, different warehouses, um, day ranges, those kind of things. Um, and as we, uh, we'll, we'll come back to this during the process because we'll see you can come in here and look at things like, uh, as well as stats on query execution, you can come look at the profile, execution plan, those kind of, those kind of things. So, it's time to start to, to start building some stuff, really. Um, so as you can see, uh, again, we're, we're logged in as Alex the admin, and we're using the ZTS um, admin role. We'll come back to that in a bit. It's worth also pointing out on here the context of what we're currently doing in the worksheet. So we can change this using a couple of different ways. We can change it using commands directly from the, from the script here. It's just worth bearing in mind that you can see up, up here what's actually going on at any particular time. So we're using the ZTS admin role, this option here will let us select the warehouse you want to use, database, and the schema. So normal kind of normal kind of stuff like that. So in that case, um, we get going. So I can create my uh, ZTS database like that, and as you can see, it's successfully created. And I can switch into that. So now having said use ZTS, you can see this has now changed up here to uh, ZTS. Although there's still no warehouses available, I'm using a public schema. So we're going to create some schemas. So what we're going to do is, with those different layers of our data architecture that I mentioned to begin with, we're going to create those as different schemas so we can keep them sort of logically separated and control who has access to which, um, which layers and those kind of things. So I can create my ingestion, curation, and calculation. And just listen to see what's, what's actually been created there. So <coughs> we've, got, excuse me, we've got the three which we've just created, so the ingestion, curation, and calculation. We've also got the information schema for general you know, database operational information. And we've got a public schema which um, can contain you know, various things which are publicly accessible. In this case, it's not going to be, it's not, not going to be working with that. Um, we're just going to be focusing on these three, uh, which I've just created. So now let's just switch briefly over to. But uh, so this is a. Um, S3 browsers. We're going to have a look at what files which uh, the ZTS has provided to us to work with. So we're in our zero to Snowflake bucket here. And you can see we've got these two um, subfolders, one for assets and one for events. If I open this one, you can see we've got a couple of different folders here with some, some assets. These are um, text files which have been compressed and uploaded in, in chunks. In this case, only just one, but if I switch back to uh, the events point, you'll see that got a series of um, five megabyte chunks in, there's about, I think about a thousand in this, we're loading about five gig of compressed data um, into, our, into our system. And it's just done in this way because it's easier to um, all the formats to upload in this in this format than, uh, you know, than uploading a single flat file, but you can do that as well. Um, but what we'll see is when we go back and load it, we just point it to this directory and the Snowflake tools will just recognize all of that and load it. So we've got our, we've got our um, data there in our events and our assets subfolder. If I switch back over to the interface here. So the next thing we're going to do is actually <coughs> just define where that um, external S3 stage is. So it's not actually no way to go and pick up the files. So we've got our URL with the bucket name and we've got our different um, credentials here to be able to access that. And so we've now created that stage, which means that as far as um, Snowflake is concerned, our ingestion layer, in this case schema, is going to point to this, uh, this bucket which the client provided. And then we can just run list on that. And you can see that it can quite happily see these various different files that are listed down here. Um, so we know we're good to go with the kind of load process when we, when we get to that point. And the next thing is also just to create this file format, which is just to say, various different um, parameters for the file in terms of you know, row delimiters and field delimiters and those kind of things. Um, so we created that as part of our, again, as part of the ingestion uh, schema. So, do you have to do all this through SQL? Or do you only have this to be one? That is a very good question. Uh, and you absolutely can. Yeah, you can switch over and you can do all of these things through, through the UI as well. 
obviously you can do it through here, you can do it through the uh, command line tool, but you can equally I can come in here and create some of these things as uh, file formats directly through here. Are there any data modeling tools that you can use to build a model and generate this description? Um, so, data modeling tools to. So, you can certainly create. I mean, we've obviously, we, we do a lot of work, as I can't to do a lot of work with Talent. So, you can certainly create your metadata and sort of store it in there as a repository and then use that to then go and create these various definitions and, and objects within something like that. Like, um, any particular tools you were you were thinking of? But you know, like um, so any of the tools like Irvine or ER Studio or any of the available <coughs> any of the modeling tools. Mm -hmm. So talent is you know like much more complex. It's the uh, ETL <coughs> suite, you know, like, rather than a data modeling tool. So I'm just trying to find you know, like can we use any of the data modeling tools in the market to create uh, this kind of like, uh, models? I'm not 100% sure. Yeah, I'm not sure. Yeah. Uh, because it's standard SQL, uh, yeah. SQL supporting, right? any kind of standard create table script commands are accepted. They tend to be simpler than other databases because there's no complex storage stuff to uh, present. But yeah, standard create table with all the definitions and data types are accepted in the same because it's supporting uh, standard SQL. We have yeah. actually been, <coughs> we tried one. Um, so from data analytics, and we've been trying one with a particular account, and uh, it worked fine. It's a, it's a simple tool for doing uh, mirroring of data from one platform to another. Because it uses SQL, it just worked. Okay, so that's good. Uh, what's the database that we're using? So uh, we have the storage here. So <coughs> is the database like a DynamoDB or a Redshift, or is it a proprietary Snowflake database that we have? Yes. Yeah. 
interesting one, but it's just yeah. more to separately get to the so I suppose the thing to say is both, so the S3 storage, if you're using, um, apart from this, this external stage, which is actually using a, you know, say TS in this case, their, their external, um, their S3 storage, the storage and compute within Snowflake itself is running on, say, AWS, but that's running on their, on their um, AWS tenant, and the fact that it's, it happens to be the S3 price, which has been passed on, is, again, it's not something that you're not directly being presented with a bill for that, yeah. and it's in behind that layer of sort of credit, credit system, as Peter just mentioned, because otherwise, as you said, you know, you have all the things to do with costs of ingestion, ingesting data, yeah. um, data kind of flowing out as well, maintaining different systems when you're not using them, all that kind of stuff. That's all hidden from the point of time. Does that answer? Yes, yeah. So, yeah, if I don't, if you want to come back and ask anything more about the ground, warehouse sites and please do jump in and come back to that a bit. So um, step one, so yes, just to recover, just to recap what we've done here, we've created our we pointed to our external S3 bucket and we define what the file's gonna look like we're going to we're going to load. So on to the next one, uh, which is going to be we're going to curate our event data. So we're going to take data from our well first we're going to create our um, event, event data <coughs> curation layer. And then we're going to provision a warehouse because up until this point we haven't actually spent any any money. We haven't did, we haven't ingested anything. We haven't provisioned any compute resource, so nothing actually cost anything up until up until this point. So what we're going to do is uh, we're going to use that excuse me we're going to use that warehouse to ingest data from the external S3 stage into our uh, events table and curation layer. So let's switch back over to. Here. So, as we said, step one is going to be to create the um, events table. And again, as we said, uh, as Sam pointed out, you can do a lot of this through um, through the UI. We can sort of point and click and go through a sort of creation process to define these various structures and bits and pieces. But in this case, I'm going to do it directly through um, SQL commands. So I can uh, run that. As you see, I've created my um, events table. Describe it to see, see what that, see what that looks like. So I can see down here just a, a view of all the various attributes of the table, with different um, data types, and various other you know, details of how that table is constructed. Equally, I can I switch over now and go back to the databases tab. to provide, provide almost instantly because they have a pool of these um, warehouses on the 
nodes which make up the warehouse are running and waiting to go at any particular point. Um, I think it's above a, it's above a two, 2 XL or larger, above a certain size, I think some of the larger instances. Sometimes you may have to wait for a, you know, up to five minutes for them to provision if the pool of the pool of yeah. computer nodes is empty. But usually, as you'll see here, I mean, that one obviously provisioned it you know, instantly, yeah. um, and that is usually the case. Does each client get their own VMs? I'm just thinking about the interplay between that suspend time period and I don't know whether it's normal or spot instances. Higher than that resource for the hour. No, it's because these are, you know, these are these are running on per second. Yeah, these are per second. So usually we are only paying for the physical seconds to have on. Again, if you're like a place to do the instance provisioning and there's going to be scanned behind the scenes. So yeah. You're not sharing those on the so again, here's the um, same configuration screen that I can use if I come in here to um, either modify or create this warehouse from scratch. You can see the, um, the size that we talked about here. So um, as we talked about earlier in terms of the sort of rate that these credits are consumed, we've got an extra small use of one credit per hour and then each step up in terms of a t-shirt size doubles the number of credits being used and doubles the credits um, until we get to a 4x large using 128 credits per hour using an extremely large, extremely large number of uh, nodes and very, very powerful um, process there. We can also have, I'm not going to use as much in this demo, but we can also have um, a cluster approach that we can um, scale out instead of up. So we might want to say, Having a large number, if you have a large number of BI users, and rather than creating one enormous warehouse, um, which is uh, by scaling up, we might say, well, actually, let's just have it so this this cluster can scale out to uh, ten, maybe medium warehouses instead. And again, that would be also dynamically um, situation and as it's as it's required. So you've got different scaling models depending on the exact use case that you're that you're working to. Um, Again, we've got the auto suspend and auto resume, and then just say a comment to the names we've, uh, we've talked about. Switch back over. So, a couple of other things after creating this, this warehouse. Um, first thing is we're going to allow the uh, ZTS admin role to, to use it. And also, you can control uh, which users and roles can access certain resources. Um, and I guess coming back to something which was mentioned in the previous, mentioned in the previous presentation there, something which this can be quite useful for is, as well as being able to spin up additional resources for additional departments, say another you know, marketing team came along and said, we want to do this big project, we want to start now, um, can you give us some resources? Yes, you can do it very quickly as we've just seen here, but because these resources are completely, because the warehouse is completely separate, you can very easily assign that cost to that particular department in terms of sort of cross-charging or billing. So you can very easily see who spent what, um, rather than having just one enormous <coughs> server of seven million pounds sitting there in the data center, not sure exactly who's spending money on it. You can assign those different costs to different people if you uh, if you needed to. So getting back to this, we're just going to switch over and just have to use this particular warehouse we just created. And you can see up here that it's now switched over and Mark is using our ETL warehouse. So see the little just about a little green blob there. That's just to say that this is now this is now running. And in fact, if I click on it, I can see here's the warehouse we're using. It's on. You can see the size. I can see the various other the different you know, context things we've got set here. So next up, we're going to actually do the, the main part of this, this section, which is just to import the data from our external <coughs> S3 stage. We're going to import our event data, um, and you can see we're going to copy it into here. We're going to use the um, Excel stage of the uh, S3 stage events. I'm going to use our defined file format here, which says the structure of that particular thing is. So, see how long this takes to, to run. I think when I ran this last time, it took about 30 <coughs> seconds. But uh, one of the challenges from, from doing these kind of uh, events and processes like this is that it genuinely does keep getting quicker all the time. So, potentially set myself up for failure now if this takes more than 30 seconds. But uh, Seem to constantly find that these, these uh, processes get faster and better rather than the way around. So, that one hold breath. There we go, 20, 24 seconds, so slightly faster than was uh, expected. 
um, <laughs> which is nice, right? Um, so, uh, yes, again, I can now just select, just sort of do a very standard thing, just to show the top 10 records and see what this data looks like. So we've got our various attributes in here, um, which we can look through. But let's say we want to look at how the performance varies with the size of the warehouse. So let's say maybe we should drop everything here, um, turn our warehouse up to a 2x large, so that's two sizes up by four times as powerful, and see, see how the performance uh, improves. Can't necessarily say that it's not necessarily going to be four times faster, it doesn't necessarily scale directly like that, um, but it should certainly be, should certainly be faster. So, first thing we'll do is just truncate the table to drop everything out of it. <laughs> Now we can run this next query here to alter the size of the warehouse. And again, you know, we can do that through our context in here. We can switch over into the warehouse. There's various different ways of doing it. We'll just switch that over. And we can just check that it actually has need any provision. So yes, we can see yeah, it has now switched over to a 2x large. And sometimes we're checking the provision to these larger instances that it has actually uh, has actually switched over. Now we can rerun this and hopefully it will take less than 30 seconds. So again, make sure everyone holds your breath. So you can see as it's running here, you start to get some information back on what it's actually, what it's actually doing. Um, and again, you know, we take that, so yeah, 28 or 20, plus 20 something seconds down to 10 seconds. So you can see the kind of performance in the increase that you get there. Um, in terms of actually seeing how the query executed and what it did, you can just hover over this bar here and get a brief overview of the various different um, uh, components and delays that cause the total duration. Or, as we can have a look at it later, but you can actually click into the query detail and see the detailed execution plan <coughs> for a certain amount of time in various different steps. Um, again, just to sort of briefly mention, as we talked about before, <coughs> see as all these queries we're running, they'll start to appear in the, in the history tab here as well. Um, so we've got, for example, our complete uh, statement here, which took over 10 seconds. Um, and we can see the uh, profile for that, which will show us various things to do with, again, we'll come back to this a bit later, and what's a certain amount of time in terms of um, reading from the right disk, like reading from, uh, from S3, that are processing to uh, import data. Copy of the data now, so you, you basically now have the original copy on S3, and now you have a copy of it as well. So your S3 cost will be doubled essentially. In this case, yes. So it's um, not reading off, it's not like referencing the file, like an Athena would kind of right. keep the file where it is. It's actually that's so. Copy. So in, in the first, if I switch back so I just point to this to give you an example of why that's. Okay, so usually we would have our ingestion layer, we've just got our raw data, which is our external source, our first, first thing. You're right, in this case, I've just loaded it by directly copying it. So, yes, that is going to obviously just doubling that, that cost. But usually, we would probably make some other changes as part of this step, so it wouldn't be a direct copy. Um, I haven't done those because this is zero to <laughs> 90 minutes, right? That's about zero to 120 yeah. so minutes. Exactly. So there would usually be some other some other processes and some other transformations in this in this step here, which would be um, altering that data structure potentially making some And again, when we when we move further up the stack, we see that's the new thing. Um, not making a huge number of changes to the to the data structure, but obviously there'd be more sort of data quality um, various calculation steps that we would the last thing of the example you're, you're showing us here is only dealing with structured data rather than unstructured data? Well, there is some, some JSON in here, some semi structured data. So I'll show you how, when we get to one of the latest things, we'll get through some of the semi structured Because with unstructured data, my assumption would be that some of your costs times would vary compared to what you've shown us, right? Um, So we wouldn't really put unstructured data in a, in a data warehouse. So we can handle structured and semi-structured data within Snowflake. Um, the semi-structured data can be unpacked with JSON or XML or formats. Um, if you think of unstructured data, you think of true unstructured 
Today's light images and PDFs and documents, that sort of thing. Is that, is that what you're thinking? Yeah, so you can, you can do some, some work with that. There are the Spark, the Spark connector, so you can do things in Spark if you need to. But essentially, we're dealing with um, a data warehouse style approach. So you typically only be using data that can be represented in some form in SQL. So uh, that's, that's the principle. Can can you query the files directly without copying them to staging? It's coming soon. Okay. <laughs> but for now, I mean, we take this modern data architecture layering <coughs> approach, which actually, even if you're not using Snowflake, you're using some other technology, we still would take this approach of the raw data lands in ingestion, stays there untouched for all it purposes, traceability, yeah. rewind, whatever we need. But then we curate the data, just move it into a structured format, mm -hmm. then we do the calculation and so on. But we persist the layers, because storage is cheap these days. Yes. Um, even if you're using you know, um, disks in a data center, they're still fairly inexpensive. Um, so, yeah, we, 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 yeah, we can drop the ingested data if you need to, if, if storage and space is not so So, if they can send not to me. Yep. I mean, we could have a look at um, briefly look at using Talons to do some of this work in the latest step. You could. Theoretically, just pull directly from the source, do all your transformation in flight, and then put it straight into a sort of final presentation layer at the top here. Um, that would reduce your storage costs, but it would massively increase the kind of complexity and difficulty of supporting it. So, this is, yes, you're using a little bit more storage in this case, but just for the, yep. for the benefit of making life a bit easier. But to answer your original question, in this case, yes, we are literally just copying the data yep. because I've only got 90 minutes. Right. But this is a writing process, right? You're not rewriting or you're not doing any integrity checks as you're writing to the database. In this case, uh, no, this is just just literally reading from this source and writing it here, not making any checks at any point <coughs> as process. But again, so it's the sort of things I would do okay. if we were doing it properly, like, uh, yes, exactly, those kind of things. I mean, so and that, checks. The that would just be the sort of processing of, uh, depends how you so make, do those checks and do those transformations, most of the sort of normal things in terms of. Running it until we use it to do it, those kind of things. You could do that with, uh, you could take it to the ELT approach, and you could do that directly within Snowflake as well. So you could, uh, you could do it that way. Um, and again, yeah, obviously the complexity of the transformation to get carry out so it's going to have an impact, but luckily you can just turn up your ETL warehouse to as big as you need it to, to, to increase the performance and reduce the time. Okay, so uh, I think we've got to, yeah, so I'm just going to I think done that. I'm just going to say right, we've still got our warehouse set to to X large. And while answering questions, in fact that's very convenient because you can see that it's now suspended itself. Because we were we, we were talking for more than 300 seconds, so <laughs> well done guys, that's uh, much appreciated. Thank you for letting me to show that. So um, we're going to resize that to uh, large, although it's not it's not running, but that means that next time it starts off, obviously it will uh, come back in the large size. So yes, yeah, cover that. Um, so the next up, we're going to do the do a very similar process, but for our for our asset data. So in this case, we're going to use an internal uh, Snowflake ingestion stage rather than an external one, because we're going to say we cut up. We've got our file, um, and we're going to just load that into a similar asset set with a curation layer. Again, not really carrying out any transformations in the process, but it's the sort of thing you can do at this at this stage. So again, I'll switch back over to, uh, to this slide. Okay, and so right, we're going to create our now we're going to create our uh, internal stage with ingestion scheme, which we're going to do like that, and. To upload the data, I'm now going to switch over to the uh, slow SQL utility on the command line so you can see how we can just upload this file which is sitting on my, on my C drive using this, using this command. So, how is an internal stage different to an external one? So, um, they're still both running on, they're still both on S3, um, but the internal stage is sort of Snowflake managed, so it's using Snowflakes. Storage and building process, if you that, building that same way. Again, the, the S3 costs pretty much you know, passed directly onto the user, so there's very little difference in terms of actually how the, how the storage um, or how, how the cost is you know, calculated. Um, so, the difference is that people might already have their external stage 
that data in the external stage and it's already defined there, so there's no need to copy it over to get the marketplace before loading it. Um, but as far as uh, as far as sign goes, there's different. Is there anything you want to add? Yeah, well, I mean, the, the benefit of an internal stage is you don't have to end up having an AWS account. Because if you want to stage files in raw format, one S3, we don't have to sign up for AWS just to do that. You can just use the internal stage and push to it using SnowSQL, which is what the council shows now. So we've got our Snow, SnowSQL uh, utility here. Um, you probably just about to see we've, we've uh, connected using our um, ZTS <coughs> Alex, and we're using our um, ETL warehouse here. Uh, but to show, you know, we, as it says, they're not using it, not connected to any particular database, and not using any particular scheme. But I can easily do that by using some nice uh, commands here. Obviously, you can see some predictive type ahead time stuff built in here. So we're going to say we're going to use ZTS. That's worked perfectly. And we're going to say use warehouse. We're going to use which one should we use? Because we've only created one of them, so we use that one. Thanks very much. Um, and now you can see here we're using ZTS problem for our connection. So next up is I'm just going to copy over this this file and immediately in the case of how these demos work, I've got this already uh, ready to go on my uh, history here. So we're just going to put this file from my C drive. We put this um, assets folder with zero snowflake, and then we've got a selection of a selection of files. I'm going to push that up to this um, internal stage we've just created again in an assets directory. Uh, so luckily the Wi-Fi has behaved and that's run relatively quickly. So it's just taken. A second or so, and it's uploaded our, uploaded our file. So, having done that, switch back over to this slide. Let's list our the stage that we've just created. Oops, and we can see we've got that file there we've just uploaded. So, next up, I'm going to create the table I'm going to put those assets into, as, as before with the events data, and I'm going to copy in from that internal stage using again the, the full file format that we've that's much quicker because it's only a thousand rows. And we can have a quick peek at the data by looking here. Um, we'll start to see in lots of the cases here we see um, these attributes of blank. But notice with the cars, very nicely we've got some JSON here. Um, so this is just loaded as a string into this attributes field. But you can see by clicking on it, because of the way this column is kind of configured, we can actually see the kind of structure which is laid out within the, the JSON here. Um, we'll come back to this a bit later in terms of how we can leverage this, particularly from the point of view of viewing these cars and the different um, tags and labels that are, that are defined in here. It's just worth noticing that you can actually click on it to, to view in a nice and formatted structure there. Um, so, we've done that. Let's switch back over to the site. So, we've now done that. We've um, created our internal stage and we've um, we've uploaded data from our internal stage onto our, into our assets table in curation. So next up, uh, for 4 out of 10, we're going to um, load some data from Salesforce. So in this case, we're going to say we've got some you know, various accounts um, and various other information with Salesforce. We're going to use that directly as our ingestion layer. I'm not going to, I, mean, I could take the data from Salesforce and put it into an ingestion layer here. No, but I'm just going to leave it as it is. So I'm going to take the data directly and load it into a Salesforce account statement in our, in our curation line. Um, and I'm going to do that using Talent, uh, which is an ETL tool that we work with. If you're not particularly familiar with Talent, not so important. I'll briefly show you how that, how that works. Um, it's got some nice Snowflake connectors built into it so that we can very quickly um, configure our connection to Snowflake and upload the data very, very easily. Um, it is worth also mentioning at this point that I suppose we've used several different methods now. By the time we've done this, we have used several different methods to upload um, data. So we've used um, both the, uh, the external stage in the first place to bring in the event data. We've used the command line in an internal stage to upload the asset data. Now we can use the ETL tool, um, of which there are many available, uh, to upload our um, account data. To 
talent here. So again, I don't know how familiar anyone is with, with talent or, or, or not. Um, and there's more time on any particular question at the end. We can come back and talk about this in a bit more detail. Um, but this is just a talent instance running on my on my local laptop here, which is going to allow me to run this nicely nicely built job, which will um, run this main function in the middle here, basically to read the account data from um, Salesforce, do some mapping just to sort of change the format between the source and the target, and then load that into our into Snowflake here um, using our Snowflake connector. So again, there's no need, uh, as we talked about earlier, there's no need to do too much in terms of configuring this particular component, um, because this is a nice pre-built component that Tablet provided where I can just uh, neatly store my metadata to connect to this particular uh, instance, and then just, you know, just drag and drop it onto the interface and work with it very simply. So if I just run this now, that will just take a second to build and then run. So, Again, this is running from this Talent Studio instance on my laptop here, but without going into huge amount of detail about Talent at this particular point, uh, so I'm not going to use my information about Talent at this particular point because. Now having run that, we can see, we can start to look at how some of the kind of caching works on this 
Snowflake site. So if I run this query now just to select the uh, top 10 or 10 of the events on this table, you can actually see that, that particularly quickly. If I jump into the plan, Um, what we normally expect to see, this is how this is my demo, but we normally expect to see that, um, we're going to come back to this a bit later, but because we've just used this particular warehouse to load, load those rows, we, that data is cached on the, on the warehouse and it's stored on the local disk of those instances. Again, those instances, you, know, you don't need to worry about how the instance, instances work um, and the actual architecture of that, but these compute nodes have got some kind of uh, 500 gig of SSD attached to them. So when you're working with data on a particular warehouse and you can start to populate that cache, you can pull data back from the local disk rather than having to pull it directly from S3, S3 storage. There's also another layer of um, caching that we could look at, which is the uh, results cache. Um, and so if I run this same query again, we'll see that this time it's <coughs> extremely quickly, and this is because this query is the exact query that we just ran before. So the management layer of Snowflake is able to say, well, you ran the exact same query, the data hasn't changed, so I'm just returning the same results. So, so this actually isn't using any compute whatsoever, it's just put it directly from the kind of metadata layer running over Snowflake. Um, what we're going to do next is just create that warehouse that we just talked about. So we're going to create our medium-sized BI warehouse. Um, and then at that point, Switch back over here. So we've created, we've done these steps, created our BI warehouse. Um, we're now going to do a brief bit of commission based work. Um, so we've got a kind of hierarchy here in terms of roles and commission, you know, allowing certain users to do certain things. Um, we've also got this sysadmin account on top, um, and we've got our ZTS admin role with ZTS. Alex is the user we've been working in the whole time. <coughs> now we're going to just create a ZTS BI role and ZTS BI user underneath that, um, so we can control uh, what that user can see. We'll see that rather than, you know, rather than seeing all of the tables and all of the different schemas, we can just limit what they're able to see and what they're able to work with. Uh, we'll also make sure we can assign them to different warehouse so that, <coughs> again, we're not kind of causing any contention between different workloads that are, that are running. So if I switch back over here, we're going to make sure we're using the account admin role. Um, and then we're going to just create this BI, ZTS BI role using this command. And then we're going to set up the hierarchy so we're granting the BI role to the admin role. So we've got the hierarchy coming out from sysadmin through ZTS admin down to ZTS uh, BI. Now we're going to set up the different bits and pieces in terms of permissions as we just talked about. So we're going to let this uh, role access the uh, work of the database in ZTS. Then we're going to allow um, the BI role to work on the calculation schema, but not the others. And we're going to allow them to also use just the BI warehouse. So now we've, we've made sure that they're only able to access certain tables, certain resources, and also only able to access this particular compute resource. So they're not going to suddenly start using our uh, ETL warehouse, which we might for other things, we might want to resize it independently of other, uh, of this particular workload. We're also going to let them uh, just do some, uh, just run select queries on this uh, event table and calculation schema. Um, and now we're going to create a user within that role, which is what we're going to use for our uh, BI. So, create a user with a password, um, and we've set the default role, default warehouse here, so those are all uh, three configured so that we can Configure our connection within the BI tool, we'll see it's going to use all this information. And then finally, having created that user, we uh, link them to the BI role. Switch back over to ZCS admin uh, for the rest of the for the rest of the demo, just to make sure that we're uh, using using that. So yeah, that's all that completed. We've set up our different our additional lower level BI user uh, role and then user assigned to that and set up the hierarchy between them. 
So next up, we're going to set up our BI. So as part of that, we're going to take our um, full events table that we've got um, here. And we're actually going to create a view over that um, so that the users and the BI tools don't need to necessarily work directly with JSON data. So as we see, it's very easy to work query the JSON directly within Snowflake without having to kind of materialize it into a traditional table structure. But for the point of view of letting you work with that, it's used the sort of specialist dot notation syntax that's in there, we can just create a view so that it's entirely like a normal SQL table, um, or view rather, um, for this full events information so they can work with it that way. Then we're going to connect them up, connect that up to Zoom data so we can look at a couple of graphs and see um, sort of the structure and uh, bits and pieces in there. So So in this case, we're just really going to go into Zoom Data and set up these credentials to show you a little bit about how Zoom Data can work. So again, I don't know if anyone has worked with uh, Zoom Data before, but it's a um, data visualization and analysis platform, which is uh, all cloud-based and is really, really useful for big data and real-time so it's got some really nice features in terms of being able to handle enormous volumes of data, um, as well as having neat functionality for being able to, say, uh, work with the data that's coming in in real time, uh, pause and rewind certain data sets, view it you know, previous times in, in history, and then sort of replay and fast forward, all kinds of different things to do with working with data in real time, which we'll come on to in a second. So if I log in as my um, user on this, on this tenant, um, You've actually got a neatly pre-built dashboard that's in here because you know we need to start this in the demo, so we've got things pre-built in there. But what I'll do is I'm just going to um, switch over to so Um, 
So that's going to be there. Um, let's switch back over now. It's worth noting that Zoom Data has put those queries to the data source every time. It's not caching the data. Uh, it's not storing a cache and then doing very responsive updates like some of the other platforms do, which is you know, useful to have, and you can do that in Zoom Data. But because we've got a dedicated pool of compute, for the BI and so forth, we're letting Zoom Data put those queries to the platform like that <coughs> every time. So um, you know, we can get the live results if it's on the main to the dashboard. So yeah, as Sanchez was seeing these queries coming in, um, without getting too deep in the detail, you'll maybe see some information here about the fact that because we were looking at um, just the client name Murphy, uh, I can draw this that particular particular client, you see that these queries are coming in just for Murphy and they're coming in very tight time slices here. So as <coughs> new data arrives here and we're seeing these new events coming in, this is based on um, individual sort of small slices like micro queries of data which are coming on the end here. It's not just refreshing the entire data source each time because it's aware this is the time series which is the whole dashboard is based on. So um, it's really useful in this case you've got a few million rows of people this is a <coughs> excuse me, some kind of um, I'm trying to find it using the word event, but something that's happened to the particular asset. So it could be, let's say, um, a, a change of status on some particular but sensor position. And the state is getting loaded into stone flick through like S3 or? That's a good question. This is a slightly demo style just to show how the real time thing works. That uh, we could be loading data in, in real time. There's a couple of different methods we could use to do that. In this case, what we've actually done to be able to show this sort of real time functionality is the data is actually loaded from period, I think the beginning of June and it extends past today to the future. So not really something you'd be able to do in real life. <laughs> mm -hmm. So not even nice. locking up data so you can have uh, events happening in the future. So yeah. what it's doing really is as time passes it's just querying from now yeah. in a backwards. Um, but yes, you're right, this this could be coming in through there's various different methods um, which you could use to, to load data there in real time. But, so does your like support streaming your gesture then? Yes. Yes. There's a feature called Scope Light, which allows you to actually monitor an S3 bucket in real time and ingest that data in micro batches and automatically straight into a table. So micro batches, it's not a real time screen. No, it's not true in real time, but again, this is this is a you know, an analytics warehouse. It's not a <coughs> it's not a true real time database. Yeah. I mean if you need sort of uh, millisecond precision, then there are other tools for that. But if yeah. you want it just to, to take away the hassle of being able to get data in. Yeah. The use case doesn't mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Just, just stuff. And, and just, like, stuff like having like, data connectors that can be like, connected to currency streams or that sort of stuff, or you have to kind of script that through Italians. There's a variety of different connectors in there. I'm not sure whether um, you can directly call connect API. APIs. Certainly, as you say, there's, there's other ways of doing that using Talon or other yeah. scripts. Um, unless any of you can remember if there's any kind of direct API. Not, not directly, as far as I'm aware, I don't know if there's anything coming up, but uh, it, you can typically use some sort of orchestration platform to manage that, either using a batch approach or just yeah, using a, a real time streaming approach like Snowflake. The relationship between the new talent here, and I saw a video previously yesterday it was using Matilda. So is Matilda another company or a product uh, ETL? Yeah, so that, I mean, talent, talent is, is the product that we use, but there are many other ETL products, and a lot of them have partnered with Snowflake and have great connectors. So, yeah, there are, there are loads of uh, ETL products out there. Uh, some specialize in ingestion, some specialize in transformation, or um, just the whole the whole piece. So, uh, yeah, there's definitely. If you do it for an ETL product, there's different options and they have different strengths and weaknesses. I guess that, that moves slightly outside. That, that is slightly within the kind of scenario we're talking about here. That moves outside of the snowflake piece slightly into the general question of how you want to load data, load data in. And there's various different ways you can do that. As Sam said, obviously, there we've got there's various different ETL tools you can use, of which you know, we, we 
you mentioned talent and you mentioned some others. Okay, and yeah, that was on that smooth exactly. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And so that, that would work equally, well, equally well. Um, but then there's also, you know, you can quite happily, uh, as we see with the, using the uh, Snow SQL utility, you can you know, script that directly yourself. You can use some platform specific tools, I suppose, like AWS provides here, and AWS and Shore both provide their own tools that you can use those as well. There's a, there's a growing partner with ecosystems, they sometimes yes. like to call it, around Snowflake, and uh, as one of their partners, we've been at events where we've seen just how that's growing, and it's very impressive. We've always liked Talon, we've grown with Talon, but Talon itself as a product is a very strong offering. And there is a particularly strong relationship between Talon and Snowflake, yeah. because some of the founding um, guys that, that uh, have worked with both companies know each other, which is sometimes happy. Um, but I think uh, you know, Talon, if you look at where Mark is positioning some of these tools, Talon is definitely a leader yeah. uh, in, in that uh, space. Yeah. Excellent. So, Stage we've now set up our, our BI, um, we've got that up and running, and we can see um, our data appearing in real time, pseudo real time, into our, into our dashboard. So, next up, we're going to talk a bit about concurrency. Um, as we said, there's some, due to the way the Snowflake um, system is designed, there's some very unique features in terms of preventing issues of users blocking each other and not consuming each other's uh, compute resources. So, in this particular case, let's say we've got our We've got our ETL warehouse which we provisioned, we've got our ETL user, we've been happily loading data through there. Um, but equally we provisioned our BI warehouse and said that our BI user working through to data is able to use a separate warehouse and there's no um, concurrency issue between these two warehouses because they're completely separate. There's nothing shared between them, they're just both pointing at the same data in between. That doesn't cause any issues in terms of people blocking each other's queries. What that means I can do is if I switch back to the worksheet here. What I can do is that we, we can show that by running some sort of long and expensive um, query here, I can um, consume potentially all of the resources of my ETL warehouse. But equally, if I use Zoom data, then I'm using the BI warehouse, and there'll be no kind of delay there whatsoever in terms of how the Works. So I make sure I switch back over to my ETL warehouse here using that command. And then I'm going to turn off the results and access to make sure that, um, in this case, I really want to make sure this query is going to run for a, for a while. So I'll do everything I can just to uh, make sure that I artificially create a bit of a you know, load on the uh, warehouse. And I'm going to run this quite unpleasant looking query, which is going to probably run for just over a couple of minutes in this large warehouse. When it starts, as you can see, because I've talked too long, it's now uh, paused itself again. Um, if I run this, we'll see that uh, consume the resources there, but my BI is not working. So, the first thing that's going to do is it's going to start up the uh, ETL warehouse again, um, and now it's merry chugging along, doing its doing its thing. Um, so, if I now switch back over to here, maybe so I can actually see the. Uh, um, and what we'll see is that this is still responsive um, and I'm still able to interact with the data in here even though behind the scenes the ETL warehouse is merrily doing some very unpleasant hashing and joining query which will run for a couple of minutes. Um, but there's no issue here in terms of what this is what it's doing in terms of our BI site, which is quite interesting because it means that whereas previously ETL processes were overnight when no one's using the system, this potentially means that you can then just do your ETL all the time. Potentially it's not necessarily as simple as that for all in all use cases. But you don't have to you don't have to be in a situation where you have to run ETL when nothing else is running. So that's particularly useful if people who are managing the ETL don't want to have to wake up in the early hours of the morning or if you're doing you work on a global workforce and global user base where midnight here is you know, working out somewhere else. But yeah, we can see this is uh, running away and um, doing its thing. I'm quite happy, quite easily able to interact with that. On the other side here, uh, this is again, this has run a lot faster than I expected it to, which is interesting. Yesterday it took two minutes, two and a half minutes to run, and now it's taken 30 seconds. So clearly overnight someone has um, optimised how this is supposed to work, um, and it's now an 
point we run much, much faster than expected, but you know, it's just better that it runs faster than it runs slower. Either. So, as we see here, yeah, we've, we've um, seen that it's running through Zoom data and we're still able to interact with the data. Um, put this back on, results cache back on just so that we can make use of that there. Um, and equally, if I go into query history again here, I might say let's filter by my warehouse to see that long running query that I just used. Um, we'll see this query ID here. And we'll see the profile of how this how this actually ran. So you can see from the sort of overall um, execution time up here that most of the time was spent processing because there's some unpleasant hash functions and self-joined subqueries in there which is using a quite a lot of compute resource. You can see we've also got a bit of uh, local disk I.O., which is where we're just reading data back from the warehouse cache, and a bit of remote disk I.O., which is where we're data, where the data is not available in the warehouse cache, obviously, we're going to get from the uh, S3 storage. I've got a lot of this, please. But yeah, you can see where the different stages are in terms of how the data and the resources have been used and the execution plan through the day. So the orange bar is showing me the contribution to the overall processing time of each step, yeah. which means that the biggest single use was the join. So if they, I tell you there might be a different way maybe to write this query that doesn't use a join, it might be quicker. So it gives you that uh, visualization of what the, uh, the query planner is doing behind yeah. the scenes. Um, although it's doing the best optimization for the query it's given, um, anyone that knows SQL will be able to then think about that query and say, well, there's a different way of forming that. So it gives the, the direct SQL users the ability to do that sort of thing and have that sort of visual feedback. Apart from the user feedback, <coughs> sorry, does it provide any hints and all that stuff? You know, like what, so I know it points you to the right direction, uh, that the SQL <coughs> join can be optimized, but does it provide any hints on uh, how to optimize the uh, SQL? Well, uh, let me down really to the individual query, what the query is trying to achieve. So uh, uh, it would rely on the person right to the query to know different SQL constructs and what's better in some cases than others. But what it is doing is it's giving those measurements specifically yeah. of knowing, uh, telling you where to look within the query to know which bits are using more time than others. Yeah. Yeah. And in this case, as, as Sam pointed out, if 35% of the time spent on the join, then I think even anyone who's worked with SQL would probably know that you wouldn't want to do something like a query to select everything and then join to the, to another, the same sub-query and then select from those <coughs> with some hash function concatenation <coughs> between. Not something you'd ever do in reality, um, but you, you know, as, as we pointed out, the query execution plan will point you towards that. There's no mechanism to provide hints to Snowflake to tell it which index to use or anything like that, because there are no indexes. You know. Okay. Um, if you were going to scale out like a distributed, it would actually show you like the overhead of distributing that that query. Because presumably it would run a small a smaller query would run slower over distributed, bigger queries might run faster. Or so that comes down to how you um, you want to run your scaling process. If you wanted to run one large query, it's not going to it's not going to automatically split it out over the nodes in the in the cluster. In that case, you would want to scale up to provide uh, that's a higher, higher uh, throughput. Scaling out would be a traditional thing of lots of users running with some slightly smaller queries. Under the scene, uh, under the covers, I suppose it is actually running, rather than when you scale it up, it's not just using one enormous instance, it is actually still using separate nodes. Uh, again, that's, that's a so what are you doing like an EMR process in the background to so distribute it? Things of other stuff in the background to yeah. distribute it between different types. Yeah. And it depends on how your data is arranged and how many blocks are actually used in any given query because the system balancing breaks the data down into um, blocks about 40, 50 megabytes in size. Mm -hmm. um, if the data is only in a dozen or so blocks, there's no point scaling up to a cluster yeah. size that uses as much as 20 nodes because it's not going to be able to distribute it. So right. there, there are certain limitations. There's only so far you can go. So, number nine here, we're going to look at um, a development sandbox. So, let's say you 
in traditional kind of way. You want to have your normal production database, uh, and you can also have a dev and test system made for your, your other users to come in there and work on that without impacting um, the performance on the production system. Um, but what we can actually do with Snowflake is take a slightly different approach, which is we can actually create a clone of the production database, um, which in this case we've just assigned to Alex, our developer. Um, and as part of this, we're not actually copying any data, which is a bit counterintuitive, because on the scenes, because of the way Snowflake is dividing the data up into its individual chunks and then pointing, using the metadata layer, pointing to those individual blocks on, on S3. Um, cloning the database like this just involves creating new metadata, pointing to those same blocks. So there's no data actually copy between the S3 blocks when I, when I do this. Um, and equally, that means that the dev, the dev user can just come in here and work with this, make changes as required, and at the end of it, just delete it, it has no impact on the main production database. So in a use case for this, which, which you've seen as people doing um, continuous integration processes, where they can actually just, rather than having a dedicated test system on running the whole time, they can just script the uh, warehouse so that they um, clone, the, clone the production database, run their tests against that, and drop it at the end. That can all be automated. You might perform it on actually copy the data from the disk at any point. You don't need to create copies of the you actually can do development on your live data. Without having to have some either having to have, you know, a second expensive million pound box sitting there next to it. Um, and without having to copy the data between the two. How that's how it works under the under the covers of the in a second, but once you start um, you know, for example, you make a change to a couple of records in this dev system here, at that point you're then creating start to create a little bit of extra data, kind of working on the deltas to be easy for to think of it. Um, but still your ZTS main production database here is unaffected and then you drop it, you just delete it, and then that to and go back to go back to what you work for. Um, so I can switch over to here. Right, so at this point we're going to say right we'll switch back to our um, ZTS admin role and we're going to create our temporary dev database. So we're going to do that by saying create um, ZTS dev Alex, and we're going to clone ZTS our main production database. So I run that, and it's just going to copy the metadata, and you see that as part of that, there's 100 million rows of the data in there, something like that, just under two seconds to code. It's just not actually copying any data, it's sort of real data um, under, the, under the scenes. We're still using our, um, we could still be using our. Uh, main ZTS database, but let's make sure we switch over to dev, the uh, dev ones, make sure we don't accidentally uh, do anything we're not supposed to. Um, and now what we can do is I can show that we make changes, as we said, make changes to the dev system is not actually going to affect the live, uh, live version. So if I query here and I say, right, what kind of asset types have we got? I'm just going to move this over slightly on the screen so you can see what's going on. But you can see some of the examples of the different types of assets we've got listed here. Um, and our various different types. Um, and we can say, right now, let's go and insert some, some uh, test values. We're going to insert five of these test assets. And we can say, query now and see where they are. And then, as expected, we've got our five test assets in our, um, in our asset state. But if I run the same query on, um, <coughs> on the main production database, you can see there's nothing there. So when I created these, what it's actually doing is one, maybe, or a couple of blocks underneath the data are actually going to be forked. It's going to create a new, a new block separate from the ZTS production database, and the metadata layer knows that for this dev system, we point at that new block which contains these test assets. But again, that's all covered. It's all sort of behind the covers. And it doesn't need to be So, in fact, as I can see here, I've got this three together. I've got five of those assets in the Dev database, but none of them in the uh, main live, main live system. Um, that's an interesting aside, actually, that you can write queries across environments as well. So typically, in a traditional environment, you'll have production, the biggest segments of dev, um, 
but here because everything's in together we just Know, it might be that this dev user doesn't have access to production, but you can give dev users we don't get access to production, and they're not going to be able to write any changes to the database. Plus, they'll be using their own pooling computer away from the, the production computer, so they're not going to put any additional load on the, the, work, the uh, processes that are using production data because they're really using their own computer. So, you know, start to break down some of those barriers in a controlled way between environments to make life a lot more easy for developers to, to do stuff in a more quick and agile way. And I guess on that same topic, we have this uh, through these the, the use cases and things we're going through, we have really not only to cover the sharing, the data sharing side, um, a huge amount, but that's another place where you could use so, so data sharing, different use of different bits of data. So maybe you might want to say, um, yes, the devs have access to live production data, but certain things might be hidden from, certain things might be uh, obfuscated, those kind, of, those kind of bits and pieces. Questions on, yeah. on that, I think, that particularly what we would do is require that kind of data for the developers using federation and federation. Is there similar capabilities with Snowflake so that if you've got an um, on-prem database that you need to put it back to or for the test team to look at source um, uh, you would need, yeah, you wouldn't be able to query for here back in the link to a server on on premise. Yeah, do you mean federating between Snowflake and an on prem? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, there's no native capabilities, but I'm sure there are tools out there that will allow you to do synchronization. Yeah. And another, another specific tool for federation that we want to have I suppose one way is one way you could Is that because of the way the, because of the way the pricing structure and the sort of commercial model of Snowflake works, if you store data because you're only really paying the S3 costs, it's very, very cheap. Uh, you only really start to pay and I think also start to query the data. So if you had some kind of mechanism which was loading a static copy of that on premise data into a table, Snowflake. Uh, it's, I know it's more it's more for testing. Um, and just ensuring that all the data should be <coughs> so in Snowflake to be able to go back to Snowflake. That product should be reaching out to you to sell it. Yeah. yeah. <coughs> okay. So you, can't, so, yeah, so you can't create a connection string from Snowflake to a SQL database that's not on AWS. No, you need to. That, that would be you need to. Sorry, that's the part. You need to test it. Yeah, all. Yeah, you could. Again, it depends on the exact use case, but you could take an approach of loading a static set of that data, or not static, but a you know, refresh of that data, because just because storing it is very, very cheap, um, you don't have to worry about the fact that that's a sort of cold storage versus hot storage, and all that kind of stuff, just load it and do that period directly. But, yeah. Okay. <coughs> so, I'll switch my code to, to get into so the great level. Um, their sandbox there, and we've deleted everything after we've after we used it. So, for number 10, uh, as part of this process, we're going to now talk a little bit about JSON data, which we've touched on so far. So, we've got our JSON field here, which is all the information about this car. Now, as we saw in the, from the very earlier, the very first steps, we don't necessarily have this kind of data for every single type of uh, asset. It's only available for cars, and in this case, we've got you know, details obviously about the main model. Those kind of things. Um, so you can see here the information that's, information that's stored. Um, because, as we said before, the way you can directly query this data, I can actually um, use a schema on read type approach, and I can come in here and just have a query of different, different JSON fields which are assigned to cars, um, attributes.
attributes, you're allowed to know in advance what they are. So obviously different vehicles, different types of assets will have different information, but that's fine. I can just go in here and say, well, if we're in a car, it's got a make model and trim level, um, and I can query that. What we're actually going to do is create a view at the top of that data to say, to say before, so that people can have a kind of more friendly, um, uh, you know, more SQL view type approach rather than having to deal with the sort of documentation that you get here to drill through the uh, JSON structure. But it is there, and people can work with it if they are, you know, if they're comfortable with it. So I'll switch back over here. Um, we can start to have a look at some of the JSON data that exists for cars. So we talked about this briefly earlier, but you know, if I query the sort of car here, I can see the structure, and I can see that it's all nicely formatted here, so I can see what the various different things are in terms of engine, make, model, uh, and those kind of things. But this functionality is made, made possible by a, a data type called variant. So you create a field with a data type variant rather than just a standard character um, type. What it does is that tells Snowflake that we're going to put semi-structured data into that field. As soon as we do that, it, it, it detects the package JSON, it validates that, if it's valid, it structures it nicely for views, and also allows this, this um, colon snow query that, that Dan's going to show us. And you can run an analytics on that. Absolutely, yeah, you can query that, as we'll see. You can query that as SQL and create views over the top to make it as a SQL view as well. So I've got a SQL query here, and I've got this. This attribute column here, which is the variance of Sam set, um, I can then use the colon here to jump into the make, uh, and I can use model dot base to get the model in there as well. So if people are happy to use this syntax directly, you can query straight into the JSON without having to define the structure in advance. But again, a couple of steps ahead, we'll just create a view over it so that it looks exactly like what we see. And if these attributes aren't, don't exist in the data for that car or it's any other asset type, then the other shot is not going to be expected in the table structure. It can be XML or JSON, right? The variant type. Does it take XML uh, as well? XML, yep. JSON. Oh, okay. you know, yeah, I can even load it. Yeah. So, again, then, yeah, we just <coughs> run this query to see our top 10 makes and models, and uh, the old four fiestas come out of the top there. Um, without having to define in advance again what the structure of this, uh, this semi-structured data is. And equally we can run some more complicated things like taking median values and seeing kind of the um, average average age of all the different GG registration vehicles that we can see in 2013. So that's a useful bit of information there. Um, but equally we would say, as we've mentioned a couple of times, let's just create a view calculation.cars over the top, which is rather than having to um, no, each time we're going to query a year, we can just say what the year is always going to be in there and create it as a field. Um, and we'll just do that for the fields uh, which have type of car. Now I can just directly query that using select star and I can see um, all these different things which have been pulled directly from the JSON. Um, but that's going to be as a normal SQL type user. Um, and so now we're done with that. We're done with our dev database that we've been working with. So Drop that, and that's now disappeared, and off it goes. Um, except that I didn't really need to delete that. I'd say that was a terrible mistake. I really didn't need to do that. This definitely wasn't planned at all. Totally accidental, I've deleted it. Because if I come in now and have a look, then I've only got this NTS database, and as NTS dev Alex has disappeared, um, which is terrible news. But If I show the database's history, like I said, yes, I can still see that it is still there, despite the fact that it's been deleted. You can see that it was dropped on so and so time as listed here. So, what am I going to do about that? So, I can actually just undrop the database. And it's now, if I run this one up here, it's now back. So, despite the fact that as far as SQL is concerned, as far as, yeah, as far as the SQL statement running on the site, like obviously, it's concerned, the database has been dropped. I can quite happily just undrop that um, and then uh, continue to work with it from, from there, which is, I think, should be helpful. Um, to sort of show a bit more how that might work, let's say I want to uh, break some of the data rather than just delete the database, delete the database in its entirety. So I'll switch back over to the ZTS data, the ZTS rather than the uh, dev one. And I'm going to say, let's say, we're going to break some of the data. 
interesting. So we say we've got 186 cars that are there in our assets table. And now if you say here, I'm going to accidentally, in inverted commas, delete the whole lot of them. So yeah, number of rows deleted, 186. Um, as you can copy this, just like that a second. Um, I can see, <coughs> so now I run that. Oops. Oh, yeah, because I've got that, whoops, yeah. Um, I've now got zero, zero cards in my database and stuff, uh, now I've got deleted them all. But equally, I can now get those back by using time travel. So depending on how the database is configured, and sort of different retention periods and things you can set up, I can actually say, well, rather than just count ID from uh, assets where it's ID equals car, I can say do it at a point in time in the past, so, Offset by five time, you know, offset by five minutes. Through the database, it was five minutes ago. I can see our oh, six cars were there five minutes ago. If that history has been retained, so that's helpful. Um, equally, rather than doing at a time offset, I can grab this, stick this in here, and now we can say run that query as it was moments before this transaction which is the one when we deleted things. So if I run that, again, you see the 186 rows are in there. Um, and equally I can say, using that same approach, I can just you know, do an insert into, uh, so I can replace all the car assets I deleted using the time travel to put them all back in. And then, not surprisingly, as it says there, to query the data just before a particular query was executed is, is good. Any time you've had an ETL routine that's done all sorts of stuff to mangle the data because something's going gone wrong, you can just grab the query ID of that final commit um, and look to recover the data from just before that point. So you don't have to dig back through backups and find a particular point in time. Um, you can roll back through time, as Dan showed us, but you can do it just before a certain commit occurred. Um, which gives you the ability to roll back that commit after that whole transaction is completed. So normally, once you've done with the transaction, you can't then roll it back after the commit, but with this you can. So you can actually take that back to the point four, recover the data, or just copy the whole database, or, or even just the table, um, from that point just before that happened, um, create a clone at that point in time, um, and then if you need to, switch it out with the main one to recover back to that point. So it's very great, great few simple statements rather than having to recover backups and do all that sort of usual lava. Uh, so what you're basically saying is that any change to any data in Snowflake doesn't erase the original version as it were. There's always a new version. Well, there's lots of data persist for as long as you start on the other thing. So yeah. this clever best data stuff can yeah. have, have find out uh, things for you. <coughs> how far is this group when you've got uh, 90 days from the enterprise version? Depends on, your, yeah, depends on your edition and what you've got configured, because obviously you're storing more data, so if you're small, so you might want to always have everything in 90 days, but uh, yeah, that's, that's the maximum. Plus you can then take regular snapshots as clones and keep them as persistent databases for longer periods of time as well, because there's different strategies for protection of data. Because you're never touching underlying data, right? You, it's kind of what you need is just the history of all SQL scripts ever run, and you can just create your data again to because the logs are kind of immutable once they're written. So if your data can sit over 10, uh, your, your table exists over 10 different blocks, and you change a row, a single row, it will find out which block it's in, create a new version of that block with a new row, and then point to those in the original nine plus the new one. So similar to what you said in terms of reconstructing it from the history, except that it just goes back in metadata and says, which were the blocks I was supposed to look at at that particular time. Oh, it's those ones. Now I'm just going to get those and just query back into them. And they're only cleared out, as you said, once the retention period has, has expired, which could be up to 90 days, or as, as you want to configure it. This revision is a table-based revision or a data-based revision? Uh, in terms of how you configure it, or if I can put the limits on the memory time or something yeah. like that. Yeah. Not just the limits on the amount of time. If I want to label, say, a table or a database, that's it. I have a flexibility of choice. 
Yeah. That's how you, how, yes, you can be yeah, equally well um, revert the entire database rather than in this case where I said um, to query the table at a particular point. You can well say I want to clone the entire database from a particular point in history. Do you do the database scheme or table level? So you put the random analytic. So, for example, for sort of troubleshooting purposes, you could, I mean, maybe you might say it's slightly overkill, but you could clone the entire database and create a static, create a version as it was before a particular ETL process happened so that you can query and see what the data is actually doing at that particular point. So, just in case you have, there are certain things that are and there might be the things that are other, some other users are creating. So, if I want to revert back to a point in time, would I have the ability to see what the other users have executed for that particular object or a scheme? So you can see, yeah, because you've got the um, history in here, I've got the thing. The administrator can see everything that they've done. Yeah, but if I... And, if I, and use those queries, query based on those types of things. Yeah, so just wanted to make sure, yeah, like, so if I'm reverting my things, what else is it going to revert for other users? Uh, so, yeah, so this is the kind of transaction sequence because it's got to be transaction based and sort of asset, asset compliant. So if you're reverting to a point, a particular point in time, let's say that there's, there's a different way of looking at it. Whereas you're reverting to say before a particular statement was executed, that actually means to a particular point in time. It's not it, it won't say transactions which happened before or after that can still be included. Um, it's just that the transaction statement ID will mean that at that particular point in time, 10.05 on that particular day, revert to that point. It's just that rather than having to find when that transaction actually occurred, you can just use the idea of it. Yeah, so it's just, uh, you know, like that I'm reverting uh, uh, changes that the other users have made between that time. So it's just, you know, like notifying them, you know, that. Uh, yeah, you might see the history of what's changed and who's changed. I mean, I, I guess you can compare it to um, redo log approach where you can actually look at exactly what was changed in each step. Yeah. Yeah. But the trouble with that approach is then, change, even though I can see my changes, those changes might then have been superseded later in time, specifically this specific rows might have changed. So you can never be entirely sure unless you do a full log examination of, of who's exactly changed what. So, so and, and as Dan said, it's got to be asset compliant. So you've got to have that chronological transaction history. Uh, but you can see from the history what's happened. So if you're going to roll back in time, you can see what's happened. And if someone else has been doing some stuff, you can let them know. Would, would, a, would a different way of understanding this be one way to see uh, your, your data lake or data warehouse where your original data sits that doesn't suffer any changes? And this as your query environment where users may make changes, but those Changes become irrelevant after 90 days. That's um, yeah. That's the other way of looking at it. You could, I mean, in terms of how this generally fits into the to the whole process, you could say that this entire structure we've just built here is a data lake of sorts that's supporting the structure and semi structure data. Very query based. Yes. Or you could be loading it from some other data lake of sorts as we just described. Yeah. So you could you could view it as a Okay. okay, so we'll switch back over here. Um, just to quickly recap what we've uh, gone through, before there's any final questions, but we've obviously pulled some data from, S from S3 using ZTS Limited's very nice data they've provided to us. Provisioned a, um, or logged into our provisioned Snowflake account, which is completely empty, just using this one user, and created our database on a different layer of our data architecture to <coughs> schemas. Uh, provision a bit of compute resource and use that to ingest um, ingest some data from, from S3 um, and using a nice animation turn that into uh, a nice flat competitive <coughs> all the data um, bearing in mind that we pulled some of this from external uh, an external S3 bucket we imported some of it from a file and some of it from another source in this case um, Salesforce using talent to ingest the data. And then finally we've used, we've provisioned um, Zoom data on the end to do the visualization of data. And we've provisioned our, some other kind of users and roles, um, 
and we've kept them completely separate and isolated, both in terms of their execution, so we make sure that our BI and our ETL data combine in terms of using the same resource, and also in terms of cloning the database uh, and keeping it changed and isolated from that point of view. So our devs can merrily do whatever they want to their copy of the database in the full knowledge that the production data will remain completely untouched and undamaged. Um, and that brings us to the end. So uh, thanks for listening to all of that. I think we probably just about on time. Um, any questions that we haven't covered? Anything about sort of scenario? Any kind of questions about the architecture? Some um, deep technical and knowledge in the room about snowflakes. So. It's not really technical. It's more about development. Mm -hmm. um, what are, what's the feedback from development in regards to what? Yeah, it's, it's an interesting one. I think from the, the thing which I've been involved with, there's the, um, it lets you do some, it solves some problems which you face with data warehouse. But also because of the way that it does that, it kind of unlocks completely different ways of carrying out the same processes. But some of which I've met, you know, mentioned, like being able to load the ETL all the way through the day, which is quite an unusual way, quite an unusual thing to do. Be able to just script a clone of the database so you don't have to have a static running and you know, three separate environments with dev test and prod, you can just have one and clone it when you need it. Yeah. So it solves some problems in terms of you know, the separation of compute and uh, storage, the sort of elasticity and cheap storage and uh, those kind of things. But also, uh, so it's one of the things which I found which has been quite interesting in the examples that I've worked on as well as being not having to deal with this idea of information life cycle management where you might have the last month of data in sort of hot, high performance storage and then the last 10 years before that in some other system. You don't want to provision a server to be able to handle all of that because that's then the expense you're then using this high, high spec thing for all the data for all the time. So people end up moving some of that out into, a, into S3 and querying it there or something like that because of the way this is designed, everything's in S3 anyway, so the storage is very cheap. Just throw more compute resource at it, and as long as you're only querying the most recent stuff, um, it's still like a form that not paying for that. Some of so the issues that we face with data warehouse specifically are around getting to a place where you know the model, the model for your star schema <coughs> works. Um, and the way that we try to manage that is through prototype. It's through also through prototype. Found anybody kind of using this approach to just use it really later because it's so to be able to shift? We've, we've seen this, and certainly you can have a whole you know, set of production data in there that you can then use to um, rather than trying to move data into tables and try other things, you can just build views. Yeah, they're they as performance as, as tables because of the way the metadata is arranged. So you can just put, you know, build a whole model, prototype, great with using views. Um, try to have a little BI platform to it, get some UAT going on, everyone's happy, then you can then write the tables and write the ETL to it. So you've got, so you've got, you've got actual examples of people where they're just putting raw data in, modeling the view at the top of it, and then presenting it. Yeah, we would, we, would, we, would, we would suggest, I mean, we would suggest when you go to production, don't leave it as views, turn it, those into be turned into tables. Yeah, so prototyping, yeah, views, views are working. Uh, very well. Certainly, you can cut down the sets and sizes of data as well to keep it performance in the BI. Okay, that's probably the thing to guys going to add. Probably just do a sort of sample the process because yeah, even yeah. with the sort of speed and flexibility, you know, I wanted to take it down to every 10% of the volume or something you wanted to. Yeah. And dynamically mask the sort of sensitive items in the data. Again, if you're using production data, um, if it's going in front of people that don't need to see, that's yeah. better. You can either use secure views or some dynamic masking. Take out the sensor models. Again, there's a whole lot of stuff to do with kind of masking, sharing of different data sets with the external users and internal users and roles and all that kind of stuff, which I haven't really touched on here, which is another, another entire section of itself, which I won't trigger really go to. <laughs> okay. Do you, do they, do you support anything like serverless querying, kind of like paid, the whole paper terabyte scanned, or is it? 
Because I guess one of my questions is about scale. Like, how big can it scale? Because obviously we're. So there's still limited by the capacity of S3, I guess. What's that? And limited by the capacity of S3, which is, as Amazon say, effectively yeah. unlimited. Unlimited, <laughs> yeah. Well, so we can't have limits yet. Because well, I think, so like, we've got some clients who use like Athena on S3 for like massive queries, so like the serverless kind of query engine. How would that be different from smooth provisioning your, I suppose, your bigger nodes? Yeah, you're not, um, in this case, the difference would be if you wanted to take that approach, you could see it as very similar if you were to just spin up a warehouse, run your query, then kill it again afterwards, right. and pay by second. Yeah. So with Athena, you're just paying by a terabyte scan, but there right. isn't a, there isn't like a limit to the warehouse this kind of, Right. And well, in theory, yeah. and Amazon says it's like how much, how much EC2 capacity they have. Exactly. And I think, <laughs> yeah, exactly. I think one of the things I've run to back on the comparison before is a um, client had a problem because the way Athena handles um, changes to the underlying data structure, mm -hmm. and then you have to sort of rebuild everything, everything every time. Yeah. So it feels to me about having a person similar to what the snowflake is taking, except that that process of rebuilding the indices, I suppose, yeah. the covers, not that you have to worry about indices, but that process is sort of managed by the whole snowflake. Management like rather than you having to do it yourself. Yeah. Because the, the compute goes up, you can go to the 4, 4 XL. Mm -hmm. I think that is a. Uh, but then you can scale out well. of course, multiple yeah. 4 XL. So, right. yeah. so you could have 10 times 4 XL, which is effectively yeah. 1280 EC2 instances we'll have to see. Fresh. I'm not saying anyone's doing that. But we can, so we should. Let's try. I suppose yeah, you can you can achieve from the point of view of paying by query and paying by terabyte. Yeah. Query, you can take a. You can't do that exact thing, mm. but you can achieve a very similar, similar very result similar result scale. by with the sort of elasticity of being able to provision and uh, delete warehouses. It's just calculated in a slightly different way. And then. Well, on Azure, one of the one other question, I guess it would be like the Blob Store. It would be like, is it going to be like Azure Blob Store versus yeah. S3? Or yeah. I think it says Blob Store with the Azure. Yeah, yeah. But yeah. it just swapped out the same item to the zero, which is yeah. zero compute instead of AC2. Yeah. Four second yeah. Exactly the same thing. Yeah. Looking at benefits to customers and the terms of cost, based on your experience, where is the greatest cost that? I would probably well, okay, say that the, the, the elasticity point of view. So I think there's, for me, there's, there's three things. There's sort of short, medium, and long term. So long term, you don't have to be defining how much compute resource you need now. You don't have to worry about in a year's time. You can think about it. You don't have to provision now for a year. Um, you've also got different bits of other kind of time scales that might work. So. Do I want to do I have to worry about a particular project that might be coming up? Um, do I need to segregate that kind of compute resource there? No, because it's all sort of handled within the process. Do I need to switch things on and off by, by minute? I mean you might say the our users in the border of the UK, they're only working between, I don't know, eight and six. So at six o'clock at night to shut that warehouse off and don't use it. You could even have it that it resumes automatically when someone sends a query, but you could just shut it down out of hours and immediately save yourself about you know, two thirds of the cost of running that. Is there any corresponding increase in people reserves? There's a huge saving that they have there. We've got the town of this group looking after your own new cluster. It's a I saw a Snowflake customer a bit like this talk about their experiences, they were in the travel industry and have the ability to tailor what they're doing. They don't can quite predict what the business is going to want next, you know, and it's a very seasonal business as well. So for once, being able to take all of the cost of the particular responsibilities they've got around data and actually fit those to the demand of the business with something that truly reflects the demand as it rises and falls over the year. Yeah, must be saving money. And, and it, it's opening up as well more opportunity for them 
to focus on the value of the data and not worry so much about the mechanics of provisioning the service to their internal customers. So yeah, they were talking about how um, that much more flexible they can be, that much more responsive as a service to the rest of their organisation they can be. Someone turns up in the morning as, a, as an ad hoc demand, you know, uh, it, it can be dealt with on the spot more or less rather than in a classic you know, Teradata and Ateezer world, you've got to plan it in and, and it's that flexibility of business process, I think this, this really just alleviates that for market shift. Okay, so one thing I'd add to that, and with all those things, one thing I'd add to that is, in terms of a sort of neat segue to the, to the next point I was going to make, which is uh, quite convenient, is that to get up and running with Snowflake, you, know, you can run a bit of a POC and have a play with some data. You can get started very easily just by ingesting some data, as we've seen, just start querying it and seeing how it, how it works. Um, having done that, you, then, you don't then have to tear it down and then reprovision it in a sort of production scale. It just scales up elastically. There's no, you're not going to reach some point where you go, oh no, now we've gone over 10 terabytes, or now we've gone over 10 gigabytes rather, so now we're going to have to switch to the next tier, which involves tearing everything down and rebuilding it. You can just scale out and increase it as you need to. So it's one of the most of the other things. We've done already quite a number of POCs with this Snowflake, and uh, they've ranged in size enormously. Uh, we haven't talked much about the customer base, but they've been going for four or five years in the States. And they've got some very big clients out there, including Walmart, um, Nike, people like that, who are storing. Well, shed those. Shed those. <laughs> shed or, yeah, yeah, we yeah. And uh, we ourselves, the largest POC, we've done very much uh, in partnership with Snowflake before billions of rows of data. And how long they take to load? 38 billion rows. Yes, we have one, one uh, challenge to have 38 billion rows loaded in the uh, uh, We could have done under an hour, maybe. About an hour. Yeah, yeah. Again, it depends on how much, because you can keep cranking up the size of the warehouse. Um, but again, with, with the loads, because you're going to take um, the same amount of, you know, if you double the warehouse, it's probably going to take about half the time if you've got masses of data and the way it's analyzing. You're actually spending about the same credits. No matter how you do it, so the slides are totally yeah. yeah. So you can actually say, I'll do it half the time and spend the same money. Mm -hmm. That was a, that was a one of the easiest things to do with previous which I've worked on. So I'm saying you want to do some data, someone did some data science. If you want to say, well, you, know, you want to give them some enormous bill, some enormous server that you need to run 24/7. You can just scale it up, run the query, and then scale it back down again on you know order of minutes. But as Sam said, if you if you if it's eight times larger. Um, but it runs eight times faster, you're using the same number of credits, except that the person doesn't have to sit there and wait for three hours while the query runs. So they gain, you know, most part of seven eighths of three hours back to go and do other stuff like that and sit there and wait. It's tempting to ask you to do everything as quickly as possible. <laughs> <laughs> you quickly realise that you're in a different world and you have to attempt to do it. Are there any more questions? Uh, in conclusion, well, sorry, I'm Peter Chase, I'm another data ethics guy. Um, just a, a, a few words actually, because um, as data ethics, we're constantly looking at the, the technology landscape around data. Our core business is understanding data so that we can help our clients unlock more value in their data. And I think uh, when um, Justin, who you saw at the beginning there, was first approached about Snowflake, uh, and he said, Yeah, there's this fantastic new SQL database coming out. And it was a bit like, oh, my word, really, another one? <laughs> you know, but hopefully this morning it's shown you an insight into what Snowflake is like and why it's perhaps different. Um, that caught our attention uh, over a year ago now and led us to actually form one of the earliest partnerships with Snowflake here in, in, U, in the UK and in EMEA. Um, it really has been accepted for the cloud. You know, those are nice words to say, but actually when you look at what they seriously try to do, they've a number of guys who found this Snowflake are very seasoned people from Microsoft and, and, and the world of database uh, Oracle, I think, as well. Who um, said, you know, if we were starting from scratch and then we to know about cloud, what we do with cloud, then what would we build? And knowing what we already know, we could make a, a fair job of that. And the result of what you've been seeing this morning. As data analytics, what we're keen to do is, is help make this technology more accessible and actually round it out with 
with services and with other technologies that uh, help achieve the sort of business benefit that you guys are looking to achieve. And that's why we've produced this particular thing. We're, we're on a road to, to launching a, a new service called Data Platform as a Service, which um, I'll just to show you this bit here, basically builds um, the, the Amazon bit could equally be Azure soon, um, you don't have the choice, but basically as one service, um, we're looking as data physics to provide um, for, for a single fee, uh, a service which facilitates providing you with an analytics platform, one you can connect to any number of data sources, both internally and externally, using these technologies, so uh, a repository based on a cloud service, uh, using Snowflake and Talent, and wrapping that in a service layer, which we provide actually as, you know, as people, um, to both facilitate you getting access to sources and putting them into that, that platform. So it's a, it's a service, we run it up, we provide the, the login for it, we'll provide a web interface for it, which lets you pick and choose sources and actually select tables and the like and actually bring them into that platform. And we run that all entirely for you. And that's what we're, say, calling data platform as a service. Um, so that's, that's a road we're on, as we say, and um, it's partly based on the fact that we can uh, we use Snowflake to, to provision something like that that uh, yeah, it is where we're taking things next for ourselves and that uh, possibly some, some of our clients. Um, so, yeah, I, I don't know if there's any more questions, but I think there's some more coffee and tea, possibly. Well, maybe not. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure there's a Starbucks somewhere. <laughs> we're going to another company to do the world here, so, you know. But, um, yeah, if there's not any more questions. Please do hang around afterwards if you want to chat further with us. We'd be delighted to talk to you. Um, thank you very much, Dan. Sam as well for helping put this together this morning. Um, and if you'd like to show your appreciation.